Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. How are you? That Hawaii tells you I come from a place called the Bronx. (laughs) And it's very important that you be aware of some things about the Bronx. First and foremost, the people born in the Bronx are the only people in the world who can say, I do not have an accent. And the other thing about the Bronx, there are only two places in the world that have the in front of them. One is the Bronx, and the other is the Vatican. (laughs) And I'm associated with both of those places. (laughs) I would like to thank each of you for coming to be with me on this, the most important day of my life. It's not my birthday. It's not the anniversary of anything in particular. It's just simply the only day I have. And when people come to be with you at such a significant time in your life, you try to remember them. At least I do. And I'll try to remember you because you're here with me on this the most important day of my life. I would like to thank this marvelous and wonderful committee, Bill, Linda, Sally, the rest of the committee, for inviting me to come and share my experience, strength, and hope with you. It's nice to be invited. There was a time in my life when people stopped inviting me. I used to go anyway. (laughs) And then I'd make a 30-day retreat wondering why they didn't invite me back. So to be invited today, it's very, very special to me. These conventions are a marvelous and wonderful idea. But if we didn't have the love and the service of the trusted servants, I sometimes call them the chief honchos, we wouldn't be having conventions like this. So I would like to have us thank this committee one more time. When you come to conventions, most times you're assigned a hostess or a host. And I think we should give out plaques to the host and the hostess at these conventions. And if we were giving it out for this convention, my hostess would have gotten the first plaque. I would like to thank Yvonne and her wonderful, charming husband, Frank, for the care and concern that they have given me this weekend and my companion, Sister Rose. I say thank you so very, very much. It's Sunday. Some folks bow their heads in prayer. And some folks bow their heads to pot. (laughs) (laughs) And different things happen in different churches, different denominations on Sunday. There's a church not too far from here, and there's a sign outside the church 
for the Sunday morning service, and it says, Sunday morning service, Jesus walks on water. And then there's another sign that says, evening service, where is Jesus? <laughs> And then one Sunday, the bishop was going to different parishes, and he was at his last parish, and he was just about to start Mass, and someone came to him and said, the mic is not working. And he said, I'll wait a few moments. So finally, they gave him the eye that he could get up and start Mass, and he got up to the mic, and he knew the mic was still not working. And he says this, something the matter with this mic. And the congregation responds, and also with you. (laughs) (laughs) And then there was the minister who was outside after the church service one Sunday morning greeting the parishioners and a lady came up to him and she took his hands and she said to him you are a model preacher and he was so moved and so taken with that and he was flying the whole the whole week I am a model preacher And Friday of that week, he was sitting at his desk, and he was still thinking, I'm a model preacher. And there was a dictionary on the desk. And he opened it to the word model. And it said, poor imitation of the real thing. So the next Sunday, he was outside greeting the parishioners again, and another lady came up to him and she said, you are a warm preacher. Well, he didn't even finish greeting the rest of his parish. He ran right back to his office, and he got the dictionary, and he looked up the word warm, and it said, not so hot. I want to be assured that you're awake. (laughs) And the next one, it was a farming section of our country. And this was a newly assigned pastor. And he was giving his first sermon in this new parish. And he got to the church a little early, and he's pacing up and down, and the bell rings, and he's supposed to get up and give his sermon. There's just one farmer in the pew. So he went over to the farmer, and he said, what do you think? I'm supposed to give my sermon, and you're the only one who was here. And the farmer said, well, if I had a load of hay... And I went out to feed the cows. And only one cow showed up. I'd feed the cow. The preacher said, you got it. Up into the podium he goes. An hour later he finishes. He comes down, he says to the farmer, what'd you think? And the farmer said, well, if I had a load of hay. And I went out to feed the cows. And only one cow showed up. I don't think I'd give him the whole load. (laughs) 
I received something this weekend from each of our speakers. I took a message home from each of the speakers. It's been a marvelous and wonderful experience for me. And last night someone said to me, how do you feel being the last speaker? And every so often I'm asked that question. And I always think of when I was a senior in high school. And Friday, the very last class for the whole week, this priest would come in and talk to the seniors. And he would always begin by saying, it's Friday. And they save the good wine to last. Of course, he said that because his name was Monsignor Goodwine. <laughs> I stand in awe at this moment of God's love for me. I stand in awe of you and my relationship with you. And I stand in awe of Maurice. If you don't remember anything I shared this morning, please remember this, because this is how I want to be remembered since it's the most important thing about me at any point on a clock. I'm an alcoholic, which means one brandy, two brandies, three brandies, floor. <laughs> I'm a woman. I'm a member of a religious community. I'm an RN, a real nun. <laughs> I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in good standing, in particular the Forest Hills Group in Queens, New York. That's my home group. And the last thing I tell you about myself is my name. Incidentally, my name is Sister Maurice. One of the things that I'm partial to in our fellowship is that it's a fellowship of equals. There are no titles in Alcoholics Anonymous. No one really cares what you do for a living. I love that expression, fellowship of equals. I don't think there's another outfit in society that can claim that like we can. At least we'd match any other group that's out there. And yet, you have never been anything else in this fellowship other than Sister Maurice. Isn't that a title? I see it as my name. It's on all my important papers. It's on my driver's license. It's the name I've been using most of my life. It's written up quite well, two police stations, city of New York. <laughs> but moreover, it's the name that I gave to you when I came into your beautiful presence a while back now. A call had been made for me, and I was to go to this Forest Hills group of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I really wasn't quite sure that someone of my class and caliber <laughs> should be going to such a place as AA. So I was not a happy camper when I came. But little by slowly, thanks to you, that has all changed for me. So much so that I can say quite comfortably today, I choose to live the AA way of life. For a few years, I said, I have to go to AA, I got to go to AA, I better go to AA. But you know what? I don't have to, got to, or better. I choose to live the AA way of life. And when I talk about something being a way of life, it's not an incidental experience. <laughs> it's not something I do when the spirit moves me. A way of life to me is as much a part of me as my right hand and my left hand. And that's the way I see Alcoholics Anonymous today. But for starters, I went to this first meeting. 
I went up the stairs, down the stairs, into a little room. There was one man in the room. He took a look at me. He came running across the room. He grabbed my hand, he told me who he was, and he said, what's your name? I said, me? He said, yeah, what's your name? Well, I said, I'm Sister Maurice. Now, this man didn't say to me, your mother doesn't call you that, does she? <laughs> and he didn't say to me, we'll have a group conscience meeting and I'll get back to you. The very next thing the man said was, hi, Sister Maurice. You're welcome. And in my over 33 years with you, no one has even suggested that I call myself anything else. So I've never been anything else in our fellowship other than Sister Maurice. The name is important. It's mine. But the most important thing about me at any point on a clock is what I told you first and foremost. I'm an alcoholic. And each and every time I say that, beginning first, when I awaken in the morning, I don't know how you sleep. Of course I don't. <laughs> But I sleep primarily on my right side. And when I awaken in the morning, I don't even know I have two eyes. Of course, this one's buried in the pillow. <laughs> before I go looking for this eye, the very first thing I do, I announce before my God, I am an alcoholic. It sets the tone here. It puts me on the right wavelength. And any time thereafter that I say I'm an alcoholic, I am reminded that of all the things I do each day that God gives me, my most important job, work, task, assignment is that I stay sober. And I do that best through the principles and traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous as they have been written. When I came to you a while back, you gave me a book, and you called it Big. I thought it was an interesting way you described the book. The gal who gave it to me was much shorter than I was, and she stood out in front of me, and she said, here is a big book. <laughs> no coincidence, I'm very far-sighted. And I saw some fellows putting some shiny signs on the wall. And my eye hit upon the one that said, keep it simple. And I said to myself, wouldn't dare say it to the lady, boy, do these people practice what they preach. Because <laughs> you can't get much simpler than that. Here is a big book. <laughs> of course, now we have the paperback which I call the small, big book. <laughs> I do not call it the small book, and I do not call it the little book. I call it the small, big book. Because there is another book in the bookstore called the small book. And it talks about being an alternative to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I call ours the small, big book. Well, you know, you introduce anything new in AA, they send for you. <laughs> this fella came to me and had a small, big book, and he's pacing up and down. He's saying, hey, sister, you call this the small, big book. I said, I do. He said, that's a contradiction. I said, what do you mean, contradiction? He said, small, big, small, big. <laughs> I thought for a moment, and I said, well... For years, we have had jumbo shrimp. <laughs> if you didn't get that, you could talk to your sponsor. <laughs> well, I took the book from you, the one that you called big. And this is what you said to me. You told me I should read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I should study the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I should believe what I found there. I should share what I believe, and I should practice what I share. 
And then you said, we suggest you do that along with the people who know how to do it best. And you called that outfit the fellowship. And then you put the whole thing together and you said to me, that is a design for living that really works. What do I know about anything? I said, let me see what I can do. And that design for living has worked so well for this lady here that I don't spend a fleeting moment of my precious time looking around for alternative ways to go. I need all the help I can get, believe you me, but it is always as a secondary measure to Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcohol became a way of life for me in a very short period of time. It dictated my moods, it made my decisions, it said you will, and it said you won't. I found it very hard to eventually surrender to the fact that whenever the first drink, I thought maybe the 21st, but whenever the first drink of alcohol went into this body, mind, and spirit, two things happened. One, I didn't know how many more I was going to have. Two, I didn't know what the behavior would be like. However, in those days, if you met me along the way and you said, Sister, how many drinks did you have or will you have? I would have said two, because that's what a lady should have. And if you said to me, and what was your behavior like or what will it be like? I would have said steady as you go, because that's how I saw myself. But I know today it was very different. I was a first grade teacher at the time. And I had the reputation in those days of being the best teacher in the school. When the children came to first grade after Labor Day each September, by the end of September, my kids were ready for college. <laughs> so at 10 o'clock in the morning, I'd be working very hard with these kids. And something would start in my body, mind, and spirit. And it would be screaming in there, you need a drink. And the very next thing I would do, morning after morning, I would put up against the screaming what people told me I had so much of. And that was willpower. And the willpower approach was futile. And I went on to learn, and I'm glad I did, that it wasn't that I was a weak-willed individual. But rather, I was a diseased person. I was a sick, untreated alcoholic. And when you're in that condition, it goes beyond the strength of your will to do other than to satisfy what's going on in there. So I'd move to the next phase of the game plan, morning after morning. And I'd say, well, it's a couple of minutes after 10. These kids can go out to the bathroom. Then they can have their snack. I'll get the teacher next door to keep an eye on them, because I'm a responsible teacher. And then I'll run over to the convent, get a drink, be back when this is all over. And I'd be running across the yard to the convent, morning after morning. <laughs> and this would be my thinking. This is going to be my last drink, at least until I've done my day's work. I was too sick to recall in those days that at 5 a.m., when the big bell went off to get us into our day, my story goes back to old God's time before we went mod. And we had this bell that went off at 5 a.m. And for me to get into anything in those days, had to reach over from my bed and take that drink. And I hated doing that. And each and every time I did it, I would say, this is going to be my last drink, at least until I've done my day's work. So whenever I would take the first one, Everything would center around, when am I going to get the next one? And yet, if you met me along the way and you said, Sister, who or what is the center of your life? I would have been insulted by the question. You just called me Sister. You see how I'm dressed, every piece from stem to stern. You just saw me come out of that building called Convent, and you're asking me who's the center of my life. How come you don't know the center of my life is God? I would have been insulted by the question. Today I choose to live honestly, thanks to you. And I have no problem in sharing with you that somewhere along the journey, the focus in my life shifted 
and it shifted from God to that next drink. And I justify the use of alcohol in my life. I might say too, because maybe someone needs to hear it. It was not one of my goals in life to become an alcoholic. I do not recall getting up a dark and gloomy day or a bright and sunny day and saying, today's the day, I'll be by six tonight, watch me. I'll destroy me and see how many I can take with me. I do not see alcoholism as self-inflicted. I believe it is a sickness that comes to a person. I think it's a marvelous and wonderful idea that we have steps that suggest to us that in God's time we make amends. But I don't hold myself responsible for the sickness that came to me. However, I hold myself very, 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 very responsible for the precious life-giving gift of sobriety that has been given to me. I did not get sober. I tried to get sober. I don't believe a person can get sober. That's my opinion. I believe something bigger, greater, outside of the person takes place. They call it a miracle. And I believe the precious life-giving gift of sobriety is given. And I believe it's given by one bigger, greater than all of us put together. I choose to call that one God. So I feel very responsible to take care of the precious life-giving gift of sobriety that God has given me. So much so that I have no problem in sharing with you. If you should ever hear that Maurice is back drinking. Please, please, don't call me a victim. Call me a volunteer. And the very next thing you should say, somewhere along the line, she wasn't willing to do everything necessary to stay sober. I cannot plead ignorance today. It would never hold up. You have taught me, and taught me well, how to take care of the precious life-giving gift of sobriety each day that God gives me. Going back to the scene in the bed with the eye in the pillow, the second thing I do before I go looking for the eye, I pray the Lord's Prayer. And when I reach the part of the prayer that says, give us this day our daily bread, I emphasize the word daily because I want to remind myself that I will have sufficient bread, sufficient help for the day. He will not refuse anyone who asks for the help, for the bread. But he gives it a day at a time. It's my responsibility then to take the bread, the help, and to use it to take care of the gift of sobriety for the rest of that day. There are advantages to years of sobriety. I've had them. But as the years of sobriety increase, so do the perils of smugness. Complacency is a killer. The little sheep that strays from the flock is usually the one that's found in the ditch over the embankment hanging from the barbed wire fence. A favorite fruit of mine is a banana. And every time I eat a banana, I have a meditation. And the meditation is the banana that leaves the bunch is the one that gets skinned. <laughs> I have a drunk along that tells you quite well. That all by myself, I can stay very sick and quite drunk. But I truly believe I cannot stay sober and fairly well without you. Well, how do you really know that, Maurice? You've never left us. When God was giving out ears, I thought he said beers. <laughs> and I said two large ones. I am an excellent listener 
to the experiences of other people. I was affected physically, mentally, spiritually, socially, emotionally from this sickness. Physically, I fared out pretty well. There were times I tried to arrange my own physical death. I used to take the car, leave the Bronx, go across the George Washington Bridge, up the Palisades Parkway, and pull over around Englewood. And I would say, when those cars are gone, when those folks are gone, I'm going to run this car over the embankment because I don't know what's the matter with me. And then I'd have what I call a moment of amazing grace. And I'd say, I'll go get a drink. I'll come back and do this another time. So I was not to die physically. But there are other ways of dying, I'm sure you can identify. I suffered the death of my values. I suffered the death of my integrity. I suffered the death of everything I stood for as a woman, everything I stood for as a sister. All those areas of my life die. Outwardly, I looked pretty good, held a job, did it fairly well, tried to keep up with my responsibilities. And above all, oh, above all, I always said my prayers. And some of you have shared with me along the journey that you thought you missed the boat because you didn't pray enough. Listen, I prayed enough for you and all belonging to you. (laughs) So this disease must be so big, and indeed it is, that something as powerful as prayer will not take it away. I don't believe you can just pray your way through alcoholism. And yet we say, where would we be without prayer? Prayer is a path where there is none. When all else fails, have I prayed. But I think for folks like you and me, there's another piece that goes with the prayer. Pray and grow the boat. And this beautiful way of life, this design for living, enables us to do that, to pray and to row the boat. I denied that alcohol was my problem. And I was somewhat relieved when I learned that denial is the major presenting symptom of alcoholism. And when you're in denial, you're not in touch with reality. What I knew about my situation would fit on a postage stamp. What was happening in my life was as big as the state of Pennsylvania. But if I didn't have it up here when it was presented, then it didn't happen. Now, I had hundreds of people talked to me about my drinking and the behavior that went with it. Some of them wanted to be martyrs at an early age. The nerve of that one coming in here and talking to me about my drinking. And there were many times that I exercised the denial. My mother was in the hospital, hospital for special surgery in New York City. Very fine hospital. She was having a total hip operation. She was there for months and months. The operation wasn't as perfected then as it is today. Now I think they do it going up and down in the elevator. (laughs) I went every day to be at my mother's bedside, because that's where a good daughter should be. And one day my beautiful mother, a beautiful Irish soft-spoken lady, she said to me in a whisper, if you don't come tomorrow, it'll be just fine. You must have a lot of work to do around the convent and the school. Why don't you skip a few days? And I sat there thinking, wow, there she is with all her pain, and she's thinking of me. But I know today, because I'm in touch with reality, thanks to you, that my beautiful mother could not bring herself to say, you're an embarrassment to me. You're no help to me. I don't need you around this hospital. Now, I have one sister, no brothers, one sister, and she's also a sister. Do you get that? I call her, I don't call her sister, but she is a sister. She's my sister. And during my act of alcoholism, my sister secretly wished she joined a missionary community and lived in Mexico. It's very hard to be proud of a sick, untreated alcoholic. 
Well, my sister came to the hospital to visit my mother, and she gave me one of those come-outside-the-door kind of wings. I dutifully went outside. I figured she needed my advice, my opinion, whatever. My sister is very tall. She towers over me. And like my mother, she's a beautiful, soft-spoken lady. And in a whisper, she says to me, Why? Why would you come to this hospital at 4 o'clock in the afternoon drinking? I was just about to give a lecture when it dawned on me. We've been down this road a hundred times before. To the best of my recollection, not a word did I speak. But being a typical alcoholic, and that's all that I am, typical alcoholic, couldn't let well enough alone. So I took my right hand, the more powerful of my two, and I belted it. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, two nurses came running down the hall, and they are yelling, sisters, sisters, sisters. They were not calling us sisters because we were related by blood. But we were dressed like sisters used to dress. Some still dress today. My veil was on the floor. Hus was someplace else. <laughs> now, I learned a few years later that one of the major rules of this hospital is that no patient leaves their room unescorted. They were coming out crutches, wheelchairs, all fours. Because the word got around quickly, there were two nuns out there killing one another. <laughs> now, in the midst of this chaos, I had a couple of thoughts. Interesting enough, maybe you'll identify. I did not have the thought. Maybe I shouldn't have belted it. I did not have the thought. Maybe I shouldn't have had the last drink before I came down here. My major thought, as I'm staring at my sister, is, why did she scream? <laughs> well, you know, I look back today with a sober, clear head. Do you know it's perfectly normal you belt someone, they let out a hoop? The other concern I had, my purse had fallen onto the floor, making a rather loud sound as it fell to the floor. I was a little distracted with the purse. I wasn't too concerned about the few dollars in the purse. I have a vow of poverty. I kept it quite well during this time. But I was very concerned about the pint of holy water in the purse. <laughs> One pint of Christian Brothers brandy. <laughs> and what is the thinking of a sick, untreated alcoholic? No one leaves here with that purse other than you know who. <laughs> now, there's only one word to describe someone who would be in that position. And I had to go through a lot of other descriptions before, with your help, I could get to what's proper, right, and fitting. And if there's anyone in this gathering who still sees themselves in this first grouping, I would suggest that you leave that thinking in this room because it does not apply. I had to go through bad, hopeless, weak-willed, sinner. You should know better. But the way I would describe someone today would be sick, unwell, not playing with full deck. That's respectful. Or I heard a fellow one night at a meeting, he described himself, he said he was a quart low. <laughs> I heard another fellow the other night, he said he had a photogenic mind. He just never had any film in the camera. <laughs> well, I had to go a ways and have lots of health before I could see myself as sick and unwell. If you drink and you drive, you might miss the mark. I was always behind the wheel of a car. It was an insult to show on your face that you would drive us home. I brought you there, I bring you home. My first accident, <laughs> July of 1970, my good friend, Sister Rose, was in court over the dismissal of a teacher from her school. There was a big to-do in the archdiocese with this case. She had a prominent lawyer appointed by the diocese. I said, I will be in court to help the lawyer help Rose. <laughs> How do we affect the people on the other side of the coin? The night before the trial, Rose called me up and she said, Maurice, please, 
don't come to court. <laughs> Not being in touch with reality, my thinking was, wow, there she is with all her pain, and she's thinking of me. <laughs> well, I have heard Rose share her beautiful al story, and indeed, she was thinking of herself, and rightly so. It was not my style to push. I said, you know what? You'll have a lot of paperwork to do. I'll go to my classes. I'll meet you downtown at lunchtime. You can brief me, and I'll advise you for the afternoon session. <laughs> and to be rid of me, she said, fine. Well, I was in graduate school that summer, and I drove well fortified from the top of the Bronx to the Wall Street section of my city. It was five minutes after 12 lunchtime a working day in Wall Street, and the weather was clear. Those are the things they tell you at the top of the police report. <laughs> it's important for folks like you and me to know the weather. <laughs> a United States mail truck that was parked by the curb minding its own business got in my way, and I smashed into it. And when the policeman came on the driver's side, first word out of his mouth, you couldn't miss it. He said, sister. Now, I was a little taken back by the next part. He didn't say, sister, are you hurt? Could I call someone? You think women will ever be ordained? <laughs> he said, sister, could you have been drinking? And for a fleeting moment, I wondered, how did this guy get on the police force? <laughs> As was my style, officer, could I help you? So I proceeded to tell the officer about my friend who was in court being persecuted, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I went into a blackout, eventually a pass out. I woke up in a convent a short distance away. I woke up in a strange bed. Half my clothes on, half my clothes off. I'm looking around saying, where am I? How did I get here? It certainly wasn't my custom then. It's not my custom today to wake up in strange beds. <laughs> well, I'm around long enough to know that you have your story, but... <laughs> I always woke up in my own bed. But at a time like that, we all have the same tricks of the trade. Where am I, what happened, and how do you get out of here? I could hear some talking through a partially open door, so I tiptoed over. I was glad the door was open a little bit so I didn't have to squeak it. You know, we may be sick, but I'm telling you, we're the brightest group in society. <laughs> we don't go over to the door and throw the door open and say, what the heck happened? You go over. You're glad the door is open a little bit. You put an ear out. You put an eye out. See if you could pick up a little something. <laughs> of course, you know from previous experiences, they will be questioning you, and you don't know anything. <laughs> So I peek out and I see Rose, and I knew as long as Rose was there, everything was going to be fine. The other sister, neither of us knew the lady. She was about seven feet tall, and she was like a lunatic. And I got to the door as the big tall lady is screaming at Rose, your friend is on pills, or she's drinking. And in order to help her, you're going to have to hurt her. I thought that was poor advice. <laughs> So I took the eye and the ear in. I went back to bed to get a little rest to handle Rose, who came in and asked the going question in our lives at that time. What happened? I told it as I saw it. I lost control of the car because I was so upset about the court case. Now, in those days, the car was in my mother's name. My mother didn't know about the accident. I had the car fixed, back out on the road, three weeks had passed. Every time you talked to Rose, she had this question. When are we going to tell your mother about the accident? Never. <laughs> Why do you want to tell my mother? Well, the car's in her name. So what? The car's fixed. <laughs> then the fears that set in for a sick, untreated alcoholic. What if Rose tells your mother? <laughs> so I called Rose up, invited her out for supper, my treat. <laughs> Took her to a little restaurant leaned across the table in the restaurant and said, you dare to tell my mother about the accident. Someday you will come out of your convent. 
I'll be sitting in a car. And when you cross the street, that will be it. That is called threatening someone's life. Now, I always shared my, that in my story. And one night, a hundred years ago now, that means a long time, I was speaking someplace, and we had a friend at the meeting. She's not in program, but she came to hear me speak. And at the end, there was a little commotion because she was trying to get up to me. So finally, she got up to me. I said, what's the matter with you? She said, do you really think you would have run over Rose? <laughs> do you know up to that moment, no one had ever asked me that question? <laughs> not even Rose. <laughs> it to you this way. Of myself, no. I wouldn't hurt a fly. As a little tot, teenager, young adult, in the convent a hundred years, that means a long time, I was always hiding out. What did I have to offer? I was like part of the woodwork, part of the drapes. I'm in nothing. I wouldn't harm you. But you know, you put one drink in here. The first one. And you can paint the most tragic scene you can think of. And I could be the one heading it up. And I always like to point out, because sometimes people think, well, you know, we know you're an alcoholic, Maurice, but see, you're a nun, you're a sister, you know. I always like to point out that it wasn't that I was at Mass the next morning or that I was reading one of the 10,000 religious books that I had in those days. And the thought came to me, oh, you shouldn't kill Rose. <laughs> that isn't what happened. You know what happened? It was another moment of that amazing grace. It just wasn't to be part of my story or part of Rose's <laughs> that I would run her over. And I also like to point out that that hasn't changed in over 33 years of continuous sobriety. You put one drink in here, the first one, and you can paint the most tragic scene you can think of. And I could be the one heading it up. I don't know another sickness like this one. How blessed are we to have been called into a way of life that enables us to keep that terrible, terrible sickness in check. How blessed are we. If I fail to be grateful, I may lose the gift. Well, the disease was moving along, and one day I got a call from my boss. Now, in those days, you never, ever heard from the big boss. For her to call you personally would be in the same category as the Pope called you up and said, come to Rome. She called me personally. If she did call you personally, it was for either of two reasons. One, you were in trouble. Or there was a special assignment that only you could do. So I'm driving up to see the boss. And this is my thinking. I have enough to do. <laughs> we get there. We have a little chit-chat. She says, Maurice, I'll get to the point. Some of the sisters are saying that you drink too much. Now, in those days, you wouldn't ask a question of the big boss. I asked a question. I studied when I asked it. But I asked it. I said, well, well, well where are they? And she got a little nervous because I guess no one ever asked her a question. And she said, oh, she said, they don't want to be mentioned. And I said to myself, they feared for their lives. <laughs> and you know, in a very sick and negative way, I wouldn't recommend this to anyone. I was into one of our steps at that moment, but in a very negative way. Made a list. <laughs> of all people who had harmed me and asked God to be rid of them. Well, I asked her another question. 
I said, do you really know anything about me? She said, well, I have a file. So she went over and she peeked in and she said, oh, this is wonderful. She said, I didn't know you were doing this in the diocese and you just got this award. Well, she closed the file and she said, Maurice, I will never, ever again believe this about any of our sisters. I said, that's a good policy to follow. She gave me an apology and off I went. And I walked back to the car and I had one thought. It was right here. She will never, ever, ever send for me again. She never did. Next time she arrived unannounced and put me away. <laughs> so when I learned about this denial, because I was bothered terribly, if my life is so terrible, how come I don't know it? And I learned about denial, not being in touch with reality. I like to keep things simple. Alcohol makes the alcoholic feel fine. Yaddy, 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 yaddy. Therefore, he or she thinks everything is fine. Meanwhile, the people looking on are saying, here we go again. And I learned that. It helped me immensely. I was angry and resentful during this time. Angry with God. I had given my life to God. What more do you want? I love the word relationship. You've been my teachers about relationships. Prior to recovery, I started this game plan as a little tot playing in a vacant lot in the South Bronx, trying to relate to God, whoever or whatever he was. And this was the game plan. And I continued this game plan all the way into the convent some years later. I sat up straight. I knelt up straight. I disciplined myself. And, you know, we didn't have the expression in those days, but the expression that would have applied, been there, done that. And then when I was drinking, it was taking God on. If you don't need me, well, I don't need you. If I don't need someone bigger, greater, outside of this lady here, I wonder who I think I am. So I was angry and resentful with God. I was depressed during this time. I was in the convent many years before I picked up alcohol. Didn't like taste of alcohol, didn't use alcohol. On the 5th of January, 1967, my beautiful father, Maurice, he went to God. And upon his death, when he looked eyeball to eyeball into the eyes of God, at that moment, I believe, is perfection for anyone. And I believe whatever you lack, you will receive at that moment. And that's how my father received sobriety. He died of alcoholism at the age of 58. And I buried my father, and I went way inside. And I came out with a drink in my hand. And I can say quite comfortably today that my father and myself were carbon copies of one another with one big difference, the way we were to receive the precious life-giving gift of surprise. So I was using alcohol to lift me out of a depression. I was getting more depressed. The bargaining stage, one bargain I like to share on. I got into bed this particular night, always had my prayer beads, rosary beads, praying away, hanging on to the sheets with the other hand. I'm no sooner in the bed and I have to get up and get a drink. And I said to God, first time ever, I don't want to drink anymore tonight. Please help me. I'll do more work for you and for you people Please don't let me drink tonight. We'll see the first drink of the day. Always has the final say. And of course we had had that. So the covers get pushed back and the prayer beads go to the floor and you get up and you crawl along in the dark and you find your hiding spot and you get your bottle and you do something you don't want to do. You take another drink. And after I took that drink that night, I beat that floor and I doubted the existence of God. How could a God who loved me, a God that I was to relate to, I just asked you to help me. I'll bet there's no God. I live in the heart of New York City. And when I'm in town, I drive on the FDR Drive, the East River Drive, and I see our brothers and sisters, yours and mine. They're on both sides of the highway there. They build their homes there out of cardboard boxes and crates, and you see them frying an egg. 
They need a jacket, a pair of shoes. Our brothers and sisters. And you know, if they went over to the guardrail and beat the guardrail and doubted the existence of God, we'd say, poor socks, what they got going for them. I'm in a beautiful convent. I want for nothing. And alcohol brought me to the point where I doubted the existence of God. As we say in here, whether you come from Yale or jail, Park Avenue, Park Bench, what does it matter where you came from? I think it's very important to get to know your history, your story. But I put more energy into, where do we go from here? Whatever happened this morning, yesterday, a week ago, a year ago, or a hundred years ago, you have taught me to learn from the experience, but not to let it stand in the way of putting one foot in front of the other and being that person that God created you to be. And the other thing I did that night, I cried out at the top of my lungs. Isn't there anybody anywhere who knows what I'm going through? Because each one in the throes of the sickness thinks nobody, nobody knows what I'm going through. It's a lonely sickness. Well, I didn't know you were up the street and down the pike and over the hill and at the other end of Long Road 30 going through the same thing. But I'm mighty glad that somewhere along the line God saw fit that we would find one another in this beautiful fellowship. And it is God who has arranged our meeting. I truly believe that. C.S. Lewis, you've heard of him. He says in one of his writings about relationships, he talks about relationships in general, and he says it's as if God says to the people in the relationship, you have not chosen one another, but I, God, have chosen you for one another. If you think of the relationships that you have in the fellowship, would you of yourself have chosen those people? Maybe yes, maybe no. I like to think it was arranged. Like happened at the gatehouse in Akron, Ohio, some time back with Bill Wilson and Dr. Barr. And do you know, as a result of that arranged relationship, that's how we get to be here this morning. Wow. Well, today I make bargains, deals, promises, commitments, and I follow through. I attribute that to one fact and one fact only. I don't drink alcohol while I'm sober. <laughs> Very significant to Maurice's life. And the final stage is acceptance. The disease was moving along, and finally it all came to a head because I had two exceptional do-gooders in my life, my sister and Rose. And keeping it very simple, they snitched. <laughs> they blew the whistle and turned me in to the boss that I had charmed a few months before. They brought the boss to my mother's where I was hiding out. I noticed a marked difference in the boss. She wasn't interested in anything I had to say, and she spoke past tense. And she was saying things like, arrangements have been made. <laughs> And they're expecting you in Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois. I listened. She said you could go Friday or Saturday. I listened. Then she said, there you will find out what is wrong with you. And I said, way in here, there isn't anything wrong with me. And she said, you'll be there for 28 days. And I said, way in here, I won't be there for 28 minutes. <laughs> But, you know, there isn't anything stupid about an alcoholic, and I knew the only way I was going to get out of this room and away from these three people was to say, I go. I said, I'll go. I'll go Saturday. So I went out on an AA plane, American Airlines, the way I like to go. <laughs> and I met 64 beautiful men and women like you. And the word got around quickly to all 64 that we had this Catholic sister in treatment. 
and one by one you came to me, you beat up on yourself, you said terrible things about yourself, but you always finish by saying, you know, sister, this is a mistake for you. You're not like me. You shouldn't be here. Well, believe you me, anyone who thinks like I do, they're going to be my friend. <laughs> I had a nifty getaway plan. I scrapped it. And I said, I'm going to stay with these people. I'm going to help them. They're all so nice to me. <laughs> now, I'm not one who sits around idle. Do you know by the end of the first week, I was a therapist. <laughs> And the word got around quickly. You don't like your counselor. You don't like your group. You don't like those meetings. Talk to that sister. She knows everything about everything. <laughs> now, every day at 1 o'clock, we had what they call free time. Well, you know, do you remember those 28-day programs? They'd say, big letters, free time, and then right underneath, and this is what you'll do with it. You know, really. <laughs> well, I always did as I was told, since I was this high. Somebody said, jump. I jumped. Somebody said, stop jumping. I stopped jumping. I talk about compartments. There's a compartment in here called power of choice. See, I thought the good people had that. I, I, I'm a nothing. Nah, God doesn't operate that way. If you haven't gotten in touch with your compartments, you'll be faithful to this process of recovery and don't go it alone. You get in touch with so much that God has given in here. So you tell me, stay in my room, 1 o'clock, do the assignments. We had a nice table, tape recorder, pens, books. I'd block out what happened yesterday. I'd be there two minutes each day, and I'd take the whole table and throw it clear across the room. I'd go to the wall behind me, yelling and screaming at God, Why me? I've been so good. And this is what you've done to me. I've been so good. And there'd be blood pouring out of my head. My roommate would run out. She'd say, she's at it again. They'd come in, clean me up, calm me down. I'd be fine till the next day at 1 o'clock. I was too sick then. And long before that time, it goes back as a long time, to hear God say, you don't have to be good. You don't have to be good. You are good. That's a given. No one has been deprived of that goodness. Or where does the bad come in? Oh, it's there. That's attitude. That's behavior. I try, key word, try, to separate attitude and behavior from the person. I try, key word, to separ attitude, separate attitude and behavior from this lady here. And I continue to chip away at my attitude or my behavior through that marvelous and wonderful process of recovery. And I do it along with folks like you. You don't have to be good, you are good. I cannot help but be impressed at the goodness and holiness that sits in this room. And if you're not there yet, borrow from me till you get your own strength. When I say to someone, how are you? And they say, good. I usually say, I know that before I asked you. Tell me something else about yourself. I don't think there's another outfit in the world that mentions the words spiritual and spirituality more than folks like you and me. The key to spirituality, I believe, is getting in touch with your own goodness. And this beautiful way of life. And going along with the folks, our brothers and sisters in the rooms, helps you to get in touch with that. It's the only help I've had. Well, some 33 years later and for... Many 24s now, I have a why me question of God. Not why me, why am I an alcoholic? But frequently do I say to my God, why me, God? Tell me again. Tell me one more time why I'm sober, since most people don't receive this gift. 
And the last time I asked him was just before I was introduced. And he answers the same thing all the time. He says, Maurice, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. The big book says, God did for him what he could not do for himself. And he says, many are called to the disease of alcoholism. Very few, a drop in the bucket, are chosen for the precious life-giving gift of sobriety. And I say, well, why me? And he says, well, make your little chart. I make a little chart. I headed alcoholism. I put a simple line down the center. I put on this side of the chart, all of us in recovery, round the world, fairly big number. And you put on this side of the chart all those who are still out there. You wouldn't even see us. I find it awesome to be on that side of the chart. And I don't want to take that for granted. I don't want my attitude to be, big deal, sober, 33 years, what else is new? I want to stay in touch with the gift. So I do the why me. Well, we've established I'm on that side of the chart. Why me, God? He says, well, Maurice, how do you see death? A hundred years ago now, that means a long time, I sat with death. I found it so negative, so terrible. What is death all about? And I had some tapes, and I was doing some reading and just meditating on death. And I read a line that I had read many times before. But this time, I had a moment of amazing grace. And the line is, there's a time to be born. There's a time to die. And that's on God's count. And I believe any person goes to God in death, regardless of age or circumstances, when their work here on earth is finished. I do not see the God of my understanding, the God that I learned about from you. I do not see him as a yo-yo. Well, I'm taking this one for that reason, and I'm going to leave these three and this one. No. But your work is finished. That helps me. I may have more work for that person to do. But on God's calendar, their work is finished. And the other thing that helps me with death, I'll see those people again when my work is finished. The point. Untreated alcoholism is still listed as an ultimate terminal condition, 100% fatal. And here we are. Well, I believe our death has been interrupted. Of course, our work's not finished. There'll be tragedy in, our, tragedy in our world today. Some people will go to God, their work is finished. Others will be saved, their work is not finished. Those who are saved, I don't know what their work is. More will be revealed to them. I believe ours is defined. It's a specialized work. And nobody does it as well as the people in the rooms. It's to carry a message. It's to walk with. It's to pass it on. It's to be that fellowship. With all due respect to the church, the medical profession, other forms of help, they do a lot for us. But there's just something about one alcoholic sharing with another alcoholic, like happened at the gatehouse in Akron, Ohio, some time back. So my major assignment from God on any given day. And I take the liberty of saying, I believe mine is the same as yours. It's to take care of the precious life-giving gift of sobriety and to carry a message, to walk with, to pass it on, to be the fellowship, and many ways to carry a message. Pontificating at a podium is one way to carry a message. The message has been carried to me this entire weekend, and some folks haven't even been saying anything. And that's why we're called the program of attraction rather than promotion. It's really something when you put it all out there and reflect on it. Sometimes somebody will say, you know, Maurice, I don't know what I should be doing. I'm sober, yada, yada, yada. You know, I don't know what I should be doing. 
I said, oh, do you take care of your sobriety? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you do service? Do you carry a message? Do you? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, then you're doing it. What else do you want me to do? We'll be notified. Well, very late in the fourth week, I came to grips with this. On the 27th and a half day of the 28th day program, I got up and there was something different about me. I was crying and laughing. And I ran out and I wanted to see my counselor. And I went down to see my counselor, a beautiful Lutheran minister, my one-on-one -on -one counselor. And I, I said to him, Reverend, I said, I, I just want you to know, I'm really an alcoholic. I'm not mouthing it. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really an alcoholic. And this beautiful minister, he, my counselor, he did something that he never did in any of our sessions. He started dancing around the room. <laughs> and he got so excited. And he said, I have a prescription for you to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, if you're faithful to the prescription, you'll only have to return here as our guest. I said, I won't make you any promises. I'll see what I can do. And by that amazing grace of God as it operates in rooms like this and my cooperation with the grace, we know the program works, but if we don't work the program, it doesn't work for us. So by my cooperation, my doing my part, I haven't found it necessary to pick up a drink or any substitute since April 17th, 1971. I am not one who says I will never drink again. If I thought I would never drink again, perhaps I wouldn't be as faithful. Early this morning, I asked for daily bread. We'll see how tomorrow goes. I came into the rooms and I did the old one too. I didn't drink and I went to meetings and I went to meetings and I didn't drink and I didn't drink and I went to meetings and I could always be found sitting in the third row waiting for this thing to be finished but they weren't going to say I wasn't there. <laughs> and one night I heard a fellow share and this is what he said. He said he learned that unless he put the 12 suggested steps into his life and made some changes he could very well lose his sobriety. And I sat up real tall put a little smirk on my face because I was sure he was going to say, we don't mean that for the little sister there in the third row. <laughs> and he never said it. And with the help of my sponsor and some other beautiful folks, I learned why I was so miserable. Oh, I heard you say, change or die. And I used to poke the one next to me and say, isn't there something in between? <laughs> But that's what it comes down to if you're an alcoholic. You're always in motion. There's no such thing as I'm stuck. That would be a luxury. We're getting well or we're going back. No big deal about it. We have a marvelous and wonderful process of recovery. Beautiful folks to walk with us. My responsibility before God, I'll try. God doesn't concern himself with success or failure, and neither do I. He blesses effort. And my responsibility is to try. So little by slowly, change started to come about and continues to come about right up to this moment. Because I continue to be a student of the principles and traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I do it along with folks like you. And three major changes started to happen and continue to happen right up to this moment. The first had to do with the intellect. When I came to you, I had this postage stamp thinking. My thinking went like this, ready, fire, aim. <laughs> I was to the extreme in my thinking. I was either a one or a ten. I wasn't interested in two to nine. And we talked about that. And you said, our program teaches us balance. And you helped me to get away from those extremes. And you told me to work those suggested steps and not go it alone, and it would do wonders for my head up here. And I've had what I call an intellectual conversion. 
And then the moral conversion. I lost my value system because of this disease. And that bothered me terribly. And we talked about that. And you said, Maurice, be faithful to those 12 suggested steps and don't go it alone. You'll get your value system back. You'll be able to put first things first and second things second. And when you're wrong, you'll be able to promptly admit it. You'll be able to practice your principles in all your affairs. You'll even be able to practice the principles and you won't have affairs. <laughs> and I've had what I call a moral conversion. And the third was the spiritual you were always talking about spirituality, spiritual program. And I used to say to myself, you know, I'm glad they have a little something. That sounds good. But see, I have religion. Do you know, when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I could not go into a meeting straight in the door. I had to go in sideways for a while. Because I had these flags in my ears. Catholic, Catholic, very, very Catholic. And we talked about that. And you said, Maurice, our program teaches us balance. And you helped me to get centered with my religion. I have the same religion that I was brought up with. You also gave me a wonderful technique, which I use in many areas of my life, one of which is my religion. I take what helps me, and I leave the rest. And then I said, well, okay, tell me about this spirituality. And you said it has to do with relationships. Oh, I said, I didn't know that. He said, yeah, relating to a, a higher power. It has to do with relating to other people. Oh, that's terrific. And you said it also has to do with relating to yourself. And I got very sad because I said, oh, there's nothing here to relate to. I guess I'll never have spirituality. And you said, we'll help you get in touch. And you have taught me the true meaning of love your neighbor as yourself, not instead of yourself. You have taught me this above all, to thine own self be true. You have taught me if it is virtue to love my neighbor, it must be virtue and not a vice to love myself. And little by slowly with your help, I got in touch with the light and the life that God had given me. And today I have a life-giving, healthy, meaningful spirituality. And the only help I've had is that process of recovery and doing it along with folks like you. So when God gives the gift of sobriety, I believe he says three things to us. One, I'm interrupting your death. Your work's not finished. Carry a message. Walk with. Pass it on. Be that fellowship. Two, you will share relationship with these people. They will come into your life and you will come into theirs. And he says, third, with this gift of sobriety, I give you your dignity. Walk to all. And so my prayer for you as you go about your appointed rounds a day at a time is that you'll continue to have your sobriety, your recovery, and as a result of that, I just know. I just know you'll have your dignity. And I close... The miracle takes place. She does close. <laughs> I close first with a piece from the big book. If you haven't identified thus far, perhaps you can identify with this from the chapter, Me an Alcoholic. Here I found an ingredient that had been lacking in any other effort I had made to save myself. Here was power. Here was power to live to the end of any given day. Power to have courage to face the next day. Power to have friends. Power to help people. Power to be sane. Power to stay sober. Once again, I'd like to thank you 
for being here with me on this the most important day of my life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.